Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the mailbox for the 24th of January 2012. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you your daily dose of community interaction, gaming discussion, and all that good stuff. You can email in mailbox at cynicalbrit.com. That is mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics of future shows. Game in the background is once again Dark Messiah, as it will be for the foreseeable future. Stabby, stabby, and, well, more to the point, fall off rooftops. That one sequence makes me want to tear my hair out. Oh! Hey. First email comes in right here from Will. It says, I was watching the local news today and there was a report about two boys who racked up a 400 pound bill on a Smurfs iPhone game, unknown to their father until he got the bill. At first I assumed this was a case of an unwise decision by the father by allowing the boys to be in a position where they could do this. But then it was revealed that some of the in-game purchases cost upwards of 70 pounds, with the app being directly aimed at children who may not understand the value of money. Do you think this is an inappropriate business practice exploiting vulnerable individuals? And where does the blame lie? The parent, the boys, the company that makes the iPhone game, or Apple for allowing in-app purchases of such excessive amounts? Okay, well, I can definitely tell you who it's not going to, and that's Apple. Apple have made several changes to try and clamp down on this and have also gone to developers, specifically the developer of Smurfs Village, which is actually Capcom, if you can believe that. Yes, they came up with such a predatory business model which kind of freaks me the hell out. Honestly, I love Capcom, at least I did. And then they screwed over PC gamers a lot and stuff like that. Anyway, the, the point is that Apple has put in a number of restrictions to try and stop that from happening. For instance, they require you to enter the password when you make a purchase, whether it be in-app or on the App Store. The problem is that there is a window after you've done so, whereby for 15 minutes you don't have to do it again. And that's for convenience's sake, because if you want to purchase multiple things, having to re-enter your password over and over again is incredibly annoying. Especially if you want to buy a bunch of in-app stuff or DLC unlocks or just a bunch of different games or just any content, really. The problem with Smurfs Village is that it deliberately targeted in a predatory manner the kids within the first 15 minutes and it knew it knew how the system worked and it deliberately threw it at it and said buy me buy me press this button press this button and obviously the game was designed for kids and it was very very easy for that to happen that said while i quite frankly deplore that deliberate predatory targeting by the publisher capcom and the developer beeline the developers of the uh, smurfs uh, village game they have after a very stern slapping on the wrist by apple gone and done something about that they put a limit on what you could purchase within a certain time period it only allows apparently five in-app purchases to be made Unfortunately, that still means you could accidentally spend $500 on that game because there is one in-app purchase. It's called the Wagon of Smurf Berries that costs $100. <laughs> what? What? $100? The very notion is to me insane. And this is coming from someone who has a lot of disposable income, does play free-to-play games from time to time, does certainly buy stuff in-app for the iOS device, admittedly in games that don't suck, so they don't have that terrible freemium model of buying gold or whatever. God, I, I tell you, when I saw that in Infinity Blade, I scratched my head like, what's the point? It's like, oh, you can skip forward. Like, no, half the point is actually playing through the game multiple times and finding all the secrets and unlocking stuff and getting your weapons. Don't, don't buy the weapons. What the hell's the point? It's a single player game. Yeah, I know they added an arena mode in later on, but really, so pointless. So I, I now haven't bought anything in Infinity Blade or Infinity Blade 2 because it's a complete waste of my time and money. But anyway, besides the point, the fact that there is indeed something in a kids-aimed game that costs $100 is, in my opinion, pretty goddamn deplorable. And you can certainly blame them for that. However, however, I refuse to absolve parents of this. Seriously, I'm very much into parental responsibility iOS devices have many ways in order to stop this from happening. You can disable in-app purchases very, very easily. You can alter the time frame where you have to re-enter the password. So if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to disable in-app purchases entirely, maybe because it's a shared family iPad or whatever, you can set it to more like five wait, minutes. Sir. Just wait the five minutes, then hand it over or whatever. Or, you know, you could spend time with your kids for five minutes and watch them and get involved in what they're doing rather than leaving them with an iPad for a few hours in order to entertain themselves while you do God knows what. 
Oh, God. I, you know, I, I'm really, really getting ranty now. I'm getting very, very preachy here, and it's probably not an attractive thing to do. But whatever the case, there are a lot of options for parents to stop that from happening. You know that quote that popped up over the last couple of weeks? The idea that it is no longer acceptable in today's society to not know how the internet works? This, to me, also applies to things like iOS devices. If you buy a device like that and you give it to your kid, you need to actually understand how the damn thing works and what capabilities it has that could potentially cause you problems. You signed this thing up to a contract or you put in your credit card information, that alone should be setting off alarm bells for God's sake. I'm gonna give my kid something that has my credit card information attached to it. And then I turn around and say, hang on a second, something has got to be done about that. There is a reason why a lot of, and I do mean a lot of sensible parents, when they give phones to their kids, have pay-as-you-go on it, so they can't rack up hundreds upon hundreds of dollars of bills, and yet still it ends up happening. When will people actually learn? I have to wonder. You're giving a device that has full internet connectivity and full purchase connectivity to a kid. For God's sake, take some damn responsibility, learn the functionality of the system. It's an Apple device. A child can literally use this thing very, very easily. It is the easiest piece of technology to understand because it was marketed at idiots. It's as simple as that. They made everything simple. They dumbed it the hell down to the point where everything is a mere touch away. And don't get me wrong, there's a lot of good design decisions in that. I own an iPad, and I am very happy with my purchase. I think it's a fantastic tablet. But here is the point. There is no excuse for not knowing how something that simple actually works. I can understand not knowing how to configure a Cisco router. I cannot understand not knowing how to work an iPhone. It's basically a toaster. And like a toaster, you can get burned. Which is exactly what ended up happening with some of these people. For instance, the news article that came out on February 10th, maybe this is the one you were referring to, but no doubt there are many, many more indeed. An eight-year-old girl charged $1,400 to the iPhone bill buying freaking Smurf berries through this thing. This is what started the controversy, if I recall correctly. Take responsibility for what your children are doing. If you're going to give them something that expensive with that amount of power and risk, then for God's sake, know what it's capable of doing. But I do find the idea of these freemium games, the free-to-play games that are blatantly aimed at kids, and let's be honest, Smurf Village is. Yeah, that's not to say that adults won't be playing it. There's plenty of games that are aimed at kids that are played by adults. Pokemon is a prime example, but I feel that in-app purchases in that respect for a game that is obviously aimed at children is, quite frankly, predatory as hell. Not to mention, if I want to get on my pedestal for a moment, you know what, I don't have a moral high horse. I have a stable of the bloody things. Why exactly are we encouraging kids to take the easy way out? I'm sorry, and that's exactly what it is. It is the easy way out. What kind of an attitude is that to show to kids? You know, back in my day, back in my day, we had games that hurt you a lot. They were hard, and you were encouraged to keep trying at it. It's like, hey, I got this game. And I have to keep trying, keep trying, keep beating it because, hey, you know, I didn't have thousands of games when I was a kid. I had a fairly limited number of games, only the ones that I was either bought for Christmas or my birthday or was able to save up for myself with my limited amount of pocket money. And I played the hell out of those games and those games taught me various lessons, including the fact that you have to actually persevere in order to get anywhere in a game or indeed in life. So tell me what kind of lesson this is teaching a kid. Well. You could work, and you could play the game, and you could progress at a slow pace based on how well you are actually doing in this game. Or, you know what, you could pay some money and just skip the queue, skip the line. I don't even know how the game is designed, honestly. Apparently, I, there are some exclusive items that can't be gotten via the normal means, which I definitely don't like. That is bad, bad, bad game design for free to play. But unfortunately, the iOS market is very much a wild west at the moment when it comes to free to play and freemium games. PC games have tightened things up, especially when they've seen how successful the League of Legends model is, whereby you simply cannot buy anything that you can't acquire in game otherwise that would actually help you. There's no way to buy an exclusive character or whatever. You can earn everything by simply working for it. Or, again, you can maybe skip the line there. But 
Uh, it's it's grim, isn't it? it? It doesn't help at all. I think it's a very bad way for the free-to-play market to go, and I honestly wish that stuff like this got punished more, but you know what? It hasn't. Smurfs Village is one of the most popular apps there is, so evidently people really don't care enough to actually stand up and do anything about this. I think if there's anything more impotent than the PC gaming crowd, it's the iOS gaming crowd. Looks like they've managed to do precisely nothing, even with major media support saying, oh god, this is an outcry. Did it affect it? Nope. Not one little bit. It's astonishing what publishers and developers can get away with on that platform. It really, really is. We think we've got it bad. Oh no. iOS is much worse. This one comes in from Mike Braun that says, While StarCraft 2 is interesting and fun to watch, I feel that the fact that it seems to totally dominate the competitive RTS scene could lead to other RTS games that could be equally good to watch falling by the wayside. And anyone who would like to play an RTS game at a competitive level being almost forced to play StarCraft 2, even if they prefer other styles of RTS, as everyone seems to be playing StarCraft 2, and they won't get the big challenge playing something else. My god, man! Commas! Commas! Or oh, full stops! Just something! <sighs> anyway, do you think that top-level play for each genre can support multiple games, or does it need the stability of one, or maybe two games to produce consistent high-level play? Well, honestly, it comes down to what people want to watch. There are multiple fighting games that have success, but the scene is nowhere near as large as the StarCraft 2 scene right now. And funnily enough, the uh, view counts for stuff like League of Legends is actually higher than StarCraft 2. Admittedly, they don't have anywhere near as many events, so if you were to look at the number in total for StarCraft 2, it would, of course, be higher than that. But whatever the case, which RTS would you suggest? Name a recent RTS. Not coming up with many. <laughs> Age of Empires Online, I believe, is the latest release, and that's certainly not suited for competitive play. Akron came out. That's an indie game. That's definitely not suited for competitive play. It might have a small niche market available, surely, but as a spectator esport, not a chance. It's, it's far too complex. It's not a particularly good looking game. It's certainly not a spectator esport. What, again, what suggestion do you have? There are barely any RTSs released these days. Have you not noticed that? There are only really two companies making RTS, Blizzard and Relic. And Relic are now bringing out third-person shooters and stuff like that. So I don't know which game would actually overtake it. Dawn of War 2 certainly can't. It's not properly balanced for one thing, and Relic games often aren't. I was actually talking to Huck. A while ago. You might know who Huck is. Huck is a StarCraft 2 player, currently lives in Korea. He's very good at what he does. I was talking to Huck at the Asus ROG, and he was talking about his previous gaming career, which was in Company of Heroes, and we were talking about how unbalanced the expansion was, and he was saying that he used to play Panzer Elite as a joke. This guy was apparently really, really good at the game. I think it was called Gosu Huck, if I recall correctly, in that game. One way or the other. He was really, really good, and he said he used to play Panzer Elite as a joke if he wanted to do something that kind of handicapped him to give him a bit of fun, because for the longest time, Panzer Elite was incredibly broken. I stopped playing that game online probably about a year ago. I don't know if they'd fixed it by that point, but Panzer Elite was blatantly the weakest of the four sides there, and it actually goes further than that. If you were to look at the way that Relic has balanced expansions, they have done a particularly piss-poor job. When they released Chaos Rising, Chaos was broken as hell in multiplayer. When they released Dark Crusade, Necrons were unbelievably broken, and I'm not even going to start with Soulstorm. Thankfully, Relic can't be blamed for that because it wasn't their game. It was Iron Laws, but who is there to create a balanced RTS that is spectator-friendly? Name one company that could do that right now, or is even interested in putting something like that together right now, because I can't come up with anyone. So they're not going to be gas-powered games, I can tell you that for a fact. Don't even get me started with Supreme Commander 2. Blah. The fact of the matter is that, is it healthy to have just one game at the top? Probably not. And even the sports world doesn't have that. Obviously, in Europe and Africa and places like that, soccer, i.e. I, football, you know, I'm going to say it, it's just football, very, very popular, very popular. But, of course, in America, you've then got things like the NFL. Basketball is very popular as well. You don't have one dominant sport there. You've got the NFL, you've got baseball, you've got basketball. All three of these are very, very popular. And then you've got, say, the second tier of sports beyond that that are still popular enough. So, yes, the scene does need to have multiple games, but you don't need to be interested in multiple games. I feel that it's okay for someone just to be a StarCraft 2 fan. They don't have to be an eSports fan. I don't expect someone who likes StarCraft 2 to also just sit by and watch 
Street Fighter or Quake or anything like that and actually have fun enjoying it. Sure, expose yourself to something new, you might like it. There's nothing wrong with that. At least try something. Try anything once, in my opinion, but I don't think the same person needs to watch the same stuff. But there is a market, certainly, for more than one game. The problem is just no one's making an RTS at the moment. Nobody. Stability, consistency in high-level play, I don't think it really matters one way or the other. High-level play is going to differ depending on what kind of game you're actually playing. So, as far as I'm concerned, the scenes are pretty much self-contained with a little bit of crossover. Certainly, StarCraft 2 has some crossover with WarCraft 3, because people are coming over from that. And it also has crossover with Brood War for very obvious reasons. Plus, people are starting to come over from that as well in Korea. But, really, I don't think we need multiple RTSs. Not on an esports side of things, anyway. I mean, honestly, I want multiple RTSs because I want to play an RTS again. I love RTS, for God's sake. I absolutely adore it. And there hasn't been a good one come out since Age of Empires Online. And then before that, last good RTS, aside from StarCraft 2, was... <laughs> I'm not coming up with one in my recent memory. Probably Dawn of War 2, honestly. And... Again, that wasn't really all that well balanced for competitive play. The competitive scene is small. I think that they've nailed down the balance issues now, if I recall correctly. But who the hell knows what happened with Retribution? I didn't play the multiplayer for that. Is Imperial Guard broken in that? It probably was. Relic does have something of a history of putting out the expansion pack that has a broken race in there. And that's, needless to say, always the new race. So yeah, their balancing is not their strong point. They've got other strengths, however. So yeah, I'd like to see more RTS coming out, not even from an esports standpoint, just because I want to play different strategy games. Okay, folks, that's me done for the day. Thank you very much for watching the mailbox. Please remember to go and vote in King of the Web to build up votes for our Battle Royale appearance in August of this year, where we're trying to raise tens of thousands of dollars for charity. That would be great. If you spend 10 votes, you gain a little pip on your experience bar. Do five of those, and you get 10 bonus votes that you can save up until the Battle Royale. Thank you very much, and we will see you next time.